joining us for today's webinar. Ron Pernick, our Managing Director, will be moderating today's conversation, and we have leading experts on both sides of the Pacific joining us. Some quick housekeeping notes. Everybody here, all the participants, are in listen-only mode, but we very much would like your participation. So we'd encourage you, if you have questions, to enter those in the question box in the GoToMeeting platform. It should be on the right of your computer screen. And please, if you have any of those questions or comments, bring them any time throughout the session, and we're going to be using them um, in our interactive discussion, and Ron and I will be able to address as many of those as possible. Be on the lookout for future webinar sessions that we'll be having here in the coming months, ranging from utility clean energy benchmarking to clean energy consumer attitudes and behavior. If you're interested in learning more about partnering with us on webinar series events, you can contact me directly at my email address, y-o-n-k-e-r at cleanedge.com. I'm going to hand it over now to Ron Pernick. He's our Managing Director, and he's going to kick off our conversation and be moderating the discussion. Thanks, Bryce, and welcome everyone on today's webinar on the topic of Japan-U.S. clean tech collaboration post-Fukushima opportunities. Um, just to set the stage a bit, having personally lived and worked in Japan in the late 80s, um, having uh, at Clean Edge worked with a range of U.S. and Japanese clean tech firms, NGOs, corporations, and others, and just coming back from a clean energy mission to Japan, I'm very bullish and excited in many ways about the opportunity for cross-border collaboration. Um, with us today to help unpack and understand the emerging issues uh, in a post-Fukushima Japan are Nadim Sheikh, Vice President and Managing Director of the Asia Pacific and Japan region with OPOWER. We have Sean Miwa, CEO of Bloom Energy Japan, as well as General Manager, Corporate Strategy Office at SoftBank. And we have Mitsu Yamazaki, International Business Development Officer at the Portland Development Commission. Today's webinar is made possible by our partner and co-host that many of you likely know, JETRO, uh, also known as the Japan External Trade Organization. JETRO is a government-related organization that works to promote mutual trade and investment between both Japan and the U.S. and the rest of the world. Established in 1958, JETRO's core focus in the 21st century is in promoting foreign direct investment into Japan, as well as helping small to medium-sized businesses and firms maximize their global export opportunities. Before we launch into the conversation today, I wanted to set the stage here with a number of key energy developments in Japan of late. Uh, first of all, as many of you probably are aware, um, up until the Fukushima disaster, around 30% of Japan's electricity came from nuclear power. After the earthquake, tsunami, and the resulting disaster, um, all of those plants are now currently offline. Um, when I was there just recently, two plants had been up and operating, uh, but now as we speak today, all of those power plants are offline. And the nation is looking how to work in uh, this new environment. Um, I also want to just briefly talk about the feed-in tariff in Japan today. Uh, I'd say it's the most aggressive in the world, uh, one of the most generous in the world, um, which is attracting an influx of new projects. Um, but as we've seen in other nations, uh, while aggressive fits result in significant deployment, their high costs can be unsustainable, and if not properly managed, can result in quality control issues. Um, I also would point out that because of this fit, um, we've seen a banner year for solar PV installations in Japan, making it one of the leading markets uh, of the planet today. They'll likely exceed 7 gigawatts in 2013, do similarly this year. Um, and on a total market value basis, uh, they were the largest in 2013. Uh, the Japanese government has earmarked an initial $300 million towards central and distributed energy storage project grants, which I think really will bode well for Japan as both the U.S., Japan, and other nations work to integrate more energy storage both centralized and distributed. Um, and, and finally, uh, the Tokyo Olympics are now coming in 2020. And I know that can feel like a long ways away, 
but uh, I think that will be a very green Olympics, and it could result in significant construction and green development opportunities. Um, before we move on to uh, all of our panelists and the interactive conversation, I want to just give you another quick reminder. We love to get questions from the audience. Uh, my colleague Bryce Yonker is uh, aggregating all those questions, so please, we encourage you, type them into the chat box. If you have any questions you want answered about Japan, U.S. clean tech collaborative opportunities, uh, please get them in there, and we'll get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, I'd now like to move over to Nadim. Uh, Nadim, um, as many people probably know, and I was quite excited to see the news, Opower uh, has expanded its operations into Japan. Uh, you inked a major deal with, with, with TEPCO, or Tokyo Electric Power Company. I'm wondering if you could help set the stage by telling us a little bit about the current state of the energy market in Japan post Fukushima and, and the opportunities that you think might exist both for U.S. and Japanese firms uh, in the clean tech realm uh, moving into the near to midterm. If you just take a few minutes to help lay that uh, out, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll do my best. Ron, thanks a lot for inviting me and thanks for the chance to speak. So, you know, as we as we take a step back, almost three years ago, something truly terrible happened, right? That's why all of us are on the phone or on this webinar today. Um, but what I think is something uniquely amazing about Japan is how Japan has responded to the challenge and how quickly Japan is responding to the challenge. The energy market, I think, is one of the places where there is the most kind of exciting and positive development um, in Japan as a result of the 311 disaster. And I guess if I had to summarize the energy markets in Japan at the moment, the one word I would use is, is dynamic. Um, things are moving incredibly quickly. Um, introduction of competition in the retail electricity market in just a few years. Um, we're seeing both you know, entrepreneurship at the startup level. You know, young people are graduating from university and wanting to work uh, at technology startups focused in the energy space, something that was unheard of a decade ago. And industrial companies and trading companies are now very eager to partner with open arms in support of you know, their customers' um, utilities, but also in support of American companies with distinctive technology that they want to bring to Japan. So in short, if we think about renewables, we think about demand response, we think about the overall state of the energy markets, we think about smart meters. In many ways, Japan is moving its market in the next decade faster than California has managed to do in the last 25 years. Um, if you think about some of the things that we've accomplished here in the US around um, demand side management and you know innovation in the energy space. So in short, I think that there are tremendous opportunities up and down the value chain within the energy sector in Japan, both for large companies in the U.S. thinking about entering, but also I think smaller you know, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially minded companies both in the U.S. and Japan. Great. And we'll, wanna, we'll talk more about that throughout the webinar, both these opportunities for U.S. firms coming into Japan as well as large and SME Japanese firms coming to the U.S. Um, I'm, I'm now going to move over to Sean. Um, Sean, you're the head of Bloom Energy Japan. Many know about Bloom Energy in the U.S. You're heading up the Bloom Energy efforts in Japan. Uh, you're also part of strategy at the Japanese telecom internet giant SoftBank. Anyone who's ever been to Japan knows that SoftBank is as prolific as, uh, as, as Starbucks is in the United States. Um, SoftBank's founder and CEO Masa Yoshison has been an outspoken proponent for clean energy future in Japan and has even outlined his own clean energy plan. From your vantage point, what do, do prospects for clean energy in Japan look like in the near to midterm, and what type of challenges uh, are, are you seeing right now? John speaking. Uh, thanks very much for this kind of opportunity. Uh, first of all, uh, I have to say the starting point for SoftBank to start to enter this energy market is our experience in 311. That is, we a uh, mobile carrier could not maintain the power generation and the mobile service in the Tohoku area because of lack of power. That is a very original starting point why our founder, Mr. Son, decided to enter this market. And this is equivalent to what Japan should move to. That is, uh, first of all, we 
Japan needs very lack of natural resources, and also every year, every season, we have to have a very big natural disaster. It's in this in this sense, uh, unavoidable. That's why uh, we have to enhance the percentage of uh, renewable energy or clean energy. I think uh, you know the current system. Current system in the past 60 years. Uh, relatively, it works well. The current power system in Japan uh, was established almost 60 years ago, and it continued for 60 years. It rather supplies without a big change. However, uh, the based upon the experience of the 311, uh, now we uh, do recognize once again, uh, in addition to the the centralized large power generating system, we have to establish more uh, clean energy, more renewable energy, and also maybe uh, from the perspective of, of my uh, Bloom Energy fuel cells or, or service provider, uh, I dare to say the necessity to enhance the portion of distributed power uh, that is more and more important. So in the future, currently, the percentage of renewable energy is less than 10%. Mm. Uh, uh, more accurately, less than 5%. However, uh, in, in 10 years, 20 years, we, in Japan, have to increase to maybe, my personal opinion is 20% of total electricity capacity. Uh, that, that would be the necessary level. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the shortcomings and disadvantage and cons of the enhancing uh, renewable energy needs, as everybody understands, it is not stable. In case of solar PV, naturally we cannot generate power in night. And in a cloudy day, the level of power generation will be reduced. In case of wind, of course, depending upon the uh, wind. So it is fragile. Uh, it, it's inherent uh, shortcoming of renewable energy. That's why. That's why we thought bank as a package uh, or with uh, renewable energy such as solar PV or wind. We started the business of uh, the stationary fuel cell together with uh, U.S. Silicon Valley excellent company Bloom Energy. So uh, that's a very uh, basic uh, uh, situation and our uh, standing point. And finally, finally, uh, the, uh, as Ron mentioned at the beginning, 2020 Olympics would be the very much driving force. As everybody knows, uh, J Japan Olympics Committee uh, made a commitment that in, for the first time in the history, we will, we Jap Japan will uh, deliver green, green power to all the Olympics facilities. That's why I do believe this 2020 Tokyo Olympics will enhance dramatically the portion of clean, uh, green energy technology and related companies. Absolutely, uh, and, and, and I think all those on the, on the line today who are interested in Japan, let's keep that part of the dialogue open because I think there's huge opportunities uh, with the Olympics coming up. The development starts very early. Uh, let, let's move over to, to Mitsu now. Um, uh, Mitsu, uh, you bring a unique view on Japan uh, and U.S. dynamics, uh, having been born in Japan and now living in the United States. Um, at PDC and as part of the We Build Green Cities campaign, you've been taking U.S. green building firms on trade missions to Japan. Uh, you've been inking contracts in Japan, as well as hosting Japanese firms in the U.S. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of dig into something that's interesting to me. I, a lot of people always talk about China when they think about clean energy um, export opportunities and collaborative opportunities. And I've been excited to see a number of U.S. clean tech companies, uh, such as Bloom and Opower, choose Japan as their entry point into Asia instead. Um, could you talk about why Japan might be a really great first option for U.S. firms looking to expand into Asia? Right. My answer will be twofold, and I uh, kind of break it down. <clears throat> so Thank first, you. why Japan against <clears throat> why other com countries? So, so Japan against China, for example. Uh, Japan as a nation uh, is more ripe, and uh, it's easier to do business. So if you look at the ranking of uh, doing ease of doing business 
by the World Bank. Japan ranks around 10, we always between 10 and uh, 15, maybe sometime in, uh, in the 20s, but it's within a kind of a reasonable range, you know, compared to, say, Singapore or New Zealand or Canada. Uh, for Americans, it's very easy uh, to get into, and it's, uh, it's the closest ally as a nation, um, uh, although the China took over as a larger trade partner uh, in aggregate number. So uh, that's easy, and then the opportunity size, of course, China or, say, Brazil or um, Mexico, uh, for U.S. companies, it's probably, uh, it looks sexier and bigger to look at those uh, developing nations, but um, if you look at the sophistication, again, the ease, and uh, also individual project size, and the ease of doing contracting, uh, Japan is a lot um, more kinder to American firms, especially uh, those not so large firms who are new to getting into new uh, market or uh, new foreign market. So that's the uh, first part. The second part uh, of why uh, Japan is that because of all these reasons that Ron mentioned early on, the rebuild in Olympics, um, and there's huge need of rebuilding as a nation, um, there are other things, the huge cultural shift in the younger population. So Nadine mentioned about the entrepreneurship uh, being a kind of a new thing for young people to think about because for the last 20, uh, two decades, those young people in my age or even younger have been thinking about how do I participate in a society when if I'm not in an uh, elite educational path, I can't even get into the right college. So those people are now thinking entrepreneurial activities as the option for their life. And this really is the first time in the many, many decades in Japan. So that's the new trend. Uh, and also the, the whole community building, because of the energy crisis, because of the, um, the rebuilding, rebuild development issues, and the money is available from the uh, ministry, uh, ministry level, a lot of communities rethinking of their place. They want to make changes, and people are motivated. So it's a grassroots effort, and it's working. And now the municipalities and the prefectural governments are reacting to it. They may not know at the moment how to manage the change, and a lot of uh, skills such as project management at the municipal uh, department level are lacking very much. Uh, they are trying to move forward, and that is, I feel, why uh, my team from Portland have been hired by three different um, clients already. And um, it's been very interesting to see, for example, uh, we just had a, a signing uh, on MOU between our Rebuilding Cities Consortium and Smart City Planning Consortium. And um, at the signing ceremony, the, one of the head people from Mitsui Fudosan came to sign it, and his quote said basically, um, we, Japan, is experiencing a hyper-Asian population faster than anybody on the globe. And of course, that comes with shrinking population. And there's acute urban development issues in Tokyo uh, with opportunities, but also opportunities from Olympics, but also uh, energy crisis, and they want to rebuild right so that they can welcome the the people coming for the Olympics, and then that uh, the urban concentration to Tokyo uh, really created a loss of population issues elsewhere in uh, smaller towns, the regional towns, and then the lack of leadership and the innovative thinking at the municipal level really made. Um, and create the opportunity for our firms who are very good at public outreach and facilitation and listening to the local needs and then this, uh, making, making those uh, opinions part, as part of the uh, design for the uh, urban renewable, kind of an urban renewal project. Excellent. And, and Mitsu, I'd like to come back later. I want to yep. talk a little bit with everyone uh, in follow-up questions about sort of innovative business models, financial models, and even of stakeholder engagement models that might Absolutely. be translatable over to Japan. Let, let me, if you don't mind me, so I'm going to move over to all of our panelists and then go into our lively interactive conversation part of this webinar. And just as a reminder, everyone, um, uh, Bryce is fielding those questions, so please take them, and I will look out for them and add them to the conversation here. Um, I, I think any conversation about Japan today and the energy situation uh, would be remiss if we didn't briefly talk about 
uh, the first point on my slide, which is nuclear. And, and I, I'm not trying to get anyone to pit renewables against nuclear and vice versa. I don't think that's a helpful conversation. Um, I also um, aren't asking for anything overly political here in any way, but I just want to go around the table. Maybe we'll start with you, Sean, and then go to Nadim, and then go back to me too. We'll just go in that order. Just you guys are there. You're spending a lot of time in Japan. Um, I, I think it's hard for people external to Japan to fully understand what it means right now to have all those nuclear power facilities off. And, and there's a call by uh, many circles to bring them back online. At the same time, you have sort of public opposition, and you have prefectural governor opposition. Um, so I'm not really asking about new nuclear. I'm not asking about, you know, we're never going to see that 50% uh, goal that Japan had that's off the table. But just give me an idea. If you look out the next year or two, can anyone kind of give me a sense of where they think uh, nuclear will play in the equation in terms of providing electricity? Will some start to come back online? How tempered will it be? Um, Sean, could we start with you? Could you just give us a little flavor for what you think might happen? Sure. Um, it's a very uh, difficult question to make an answer, but uh, I draw everybody's attention to the coming Tokyo Metropolitan Govern Governor's election. It is Sunday, 9th of February. One of the campaign agenda, uh, the main discussion point, is whether we should restart or uh, uh, maintain nuclear power or not. So, you know, some people say whether it's appropriate agenda for a municipal government election. However, uh, having said that, uh, it it will it would be the reflection of the Japanese people's sen uh, opinion about towards the nuclear power station. Personally, uh, you know. I think the the government level, the national government level, will consider, of course, the power. Uh, the power is very indispensable part of our uh, economic activities. That's why we have to have. However, uh, what it turned out is even zero nuclear, we could maintain uh, the the power generation in the past. So, if we are smart enough. We might be able to do without a nuclear. That's why, you know, the maybe I'm not saying nuclear is good or bad. Yeah. But, uh, what I want to say is, you know, our mission, SoftBank mission, Bloom Energy's mission, would be to uh, supply stable power by creating the, you know, the the stable power generation, distributed power or the idea of power savings, or more smart, or, you know, the combination of IT and power generating system. So, um, you know, uh, the, the government level, of course, depending upon the stricter conditions, if each nuclear can pass the checking test, they, they cannot stop. However, at the same time, uh, the, there is a discussion whether we really need to restart the nuclear operation because, uh, you know, it turned out in the past year we can do without it. Uh, at the same time, we cannot ignore the discussion of cost, uh, whether it's correct or not. On the surface, the power generating cost of nuclear is relatively low. That's why, you know, to maintain competitive power supply. Uh, some people say nuclear is indispensable. Sure, so, sure. so, you know, mix the discussion and, and maybe in this year, next year, we will have a consensus. And again, the coming Sunday's election of Tokyo Metropolitan Governor would be one of the, the answer. And Sean, just so I understand that, because I haven't heard that before, and I'm assuming most people just haven't been following Tokyo elections closely. Um, is it pitted against one person who's pro-nuclear and one who isn't? What, what's the situation there? The situation is the number of uh, the applicant is more than tw uh, 10, so okay. everybody has their own opinion. But the, uh, the ex-Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Hosokawa, ah. ex-Prime Minister is running for the uh, election. That's why uh, his initiative is to, to abandon nuclear just, just right now. So 
it is it is the kind of uh, the 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 one extreme opinion, and right. the other uh, people is insisting a gradually decrease or once the nuclear uh, came to 40 years of lifetime, we should abandon. So. A, a lot of opinions. Just right now, abandoning nuclear is uh, one extreme, and and the other side is let, let's maintain and gradually reduce. So okay, well, thank you for, for pointing that out. We'll we'll run something on clean edge uh, early next week uh, once we find out what the results were in the Tokyo uh, gubernatorial election. And I'm assuming this is playing out not only in Tokyo but in other places across the country, from what I've heard. Um, Nadim, do you want to add anything to this in terms of your view? I, I want to move on to other questions, but if you want to quickly add something. Yeah, so, I mean, in short, Sean very succinctly summarized the issue, right, which is local people don't want it, um, not in my backyard. But, and what makes it even harder to advocate for a large-scale restart of nuclear is that Japan's done a terrific job of closing the gap in a very short period of time, both by creating more supply but also reducing demand. That said, um, Japan's balance of payments is way out of whack. Um, Japan cannot continue, I think, economically to continue producing power the way it has the last three years. Um, it's reducing industrial competitiveness and you know, destroying the balance of payments. So I expect you know, one nuclear plant will come back this calendar year. Um, people will realize that the world will not you know, self-destruct again if uh, nuclear comes back online at limited scale. My guess is in you know, the next like, decade, you'll see nuclear return to being like 10% of the load. Very interesting. And Nietzsche, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, well, I used to live by the, uh, one of the nuclear plants. Um, and growing up, there were you know, accidents in the past, nothing serious. But it took so long, many years, to regain the trust of local people. So this time, I think it will take longer. And the local people will have that not in my backyard attitude for a longer time um, into probably second generation. And for nuclear to come back, even in an experimental way, I think it will you know, have to be a next generation technology of nuclear. In the meantime, I think that um, a lot of companies I talk to are um, kind of bullish about uh, fuel cell technology as power generation and storage and uh, more distributed solutions and the smart energy controls. So people are excited about those things. And I think majority of people really agree that we will diversify and come up with newer, stronger, cheaper technologies to improve the, the cost of the energy. That's what they are shooting for. Excellent. Uh, Nadim, I'd like to follow up on something you and I talked about in preparation. Um, you know, in the US, uh, there are thousands investor-owned and local utilities. We have around 3,000 total utilities governed by a whole range of regulations at various lev levels, uh, different pricing, everything's sort of a little different. Everything's, all energy is local. Uh, for our American audience, can you tell us a bit more about what the Japanese uh, energy market looks like? Yeah, so, I mean, very briefly, it's a highly concentrated market. Right? Japan is the third largest market in the world for electricity based on sales um, after the United States and the People's Republic of China. So it's a very large market. Um, electricity utilities, I think there are nine or 10 regional monopolies that cover all of Japan. Um, so if you think about you know, PG&E, which is the largest electric utility in the United States, has roughly 5 million residential customers, that's one quarter of what TEPCO has. So, you know, it's it's one of those markets where it's actually very easy to navigate because you know, as, a, as an American coming to Japan, every one of these potential customers is a whale um, from our point of view. Um, but it also means that when Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese utility industry decide to move on a technology, they can move quite easily, quite rapidly, and in like, close alignment with one another from a technology perspective. And I think that's what you're seeing also as we look at the adoption of smart meters in the Japanese electric market, um, that the utilities are moving in quite a coordinated fashion to do something much more quickly than the U.S. has done. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, Sean, earlier you mentioned um, 
what your thoughts were about the future energy, uh, uh, renewable energy mix in Japan. Um, and you had said 20% capacity. I'm wondering if you meant 20% uh, generation, and if you could clarify. And then also, I'm just wondering, um, how active is Moshi, uh, uh, your, your CEO, Masayoshi Son, uh, with his energy plan, and where can people learn more about that? You know, so, the, 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 to attaining the 20% uh, goal, uh, it's not the easy uh, target, of course, and uh, a lot of issues exist in Japan. And uh, to, to attain 20% target, for example, you know, the more we have renewable, renewable energy, we have to worry about the stability, stability of the transmission line and the power condition all over the Japan, such as uh, frequency issue, uh, voltage issues. That's why you know, it's not so easy e e target, but uh, uh, maybe there would be some solution. And then uh, Mr. Son, uh, uh, of course, 50% uh, of uh, his um, motivation is coming from his personal be belief as a as a as a, a person because he do believe. We, we should not have nuclear power because it is too dangerous. And, and, and we Japanese had the experience. That's why uh, he is more serious. And also, uh, you know, the, the, the country uh, introduced or feeling tariff in Japan is, uh, I dare to say, it's very generous. And uh, we, uh, we want to fully utilize this uh, very generous FIT. Uh, to the, to rapidly enhance the portion of uh, clean energy and renewable energy. Great, and I'll be interested to watch this because, to me, 20% um, seems imminently doable. Uh, we have states right now in the U.S. that are exceeding that. Uh, it, it's not that it will be easy, but but I think you know a generating goal of exceeding 20% certainly seems doable. Um, let me move over to you, me to. Uh, and then we're starting to get great questions from the audience, so I'll include those as well. I'll start sprinkling those in. But um, me too. In addition to helping some of these green building firms uh, enter the Japanese market, I know you've been in close contact with some very large Japanese partners, um, some large trading uh, firms. You, you also mentioned sort of young people who might be getting more entrepreneurial and how that's sort of an area of, of, of opportunity. What do you think might translate in terms of some of those Japanese firms coming to the U.S.? Um, what are some of the things they might be looking for in, in, in our market, and how might we be able to connect with them? I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks for the question. I think um, first, so those uh, our clients who are mainly large real estate development companies who have portfolio projects and investments throughout the world, they are trying to uh, get out of Japan more. Uh, so they want to shift their portfolio, and you know, as, as any many people know, that large Japanese corporations are very conservative compared to others, especially in the U.S. So, sure. for example, Mitsui Fudosan announced through, I think it was, um, it was an article in New York Times, basically said they today have 70 percent of their projects in Japan and 30 or 35 percent sometimes uh, in in uh, elsewhere in the world, and they want to shift that and. They want to almost go completely opposite. So they want to have less than uh, maybe 40% in Japan, um, and then rest elsewhere. And that means more foreign direct investment out of Japan coming up very quickly. And uh, that's becoming true. I'm seeing some new move from some of these large companies. This that's is for their way. overall new investments? Yes, overall portfolio wow. of their investments. And if you know, Mitsui is the largest. Um, it's one of the largest, and most of the year they are the largest and most active. So if he, if Mitsui moves, then every, everything else, everybody else will kind of follow, and that's the Japanese cultural pattern. So you can see that happening from the investment standpoint by a real estate, um, and then others, uh, the smaller kind of medium-sized companies um, in Japan are also following that kind of trend because the, because of the shrinking market in Japan. And, uh, you know, until recently, their strategy was uh, well known, and it's called uh, China plus one. 
So you invest in China first, but just in case China becomes a bit crazy, uh, they have a, uh, investment elsewhere that could support that activity. So uh, a lot of companies have a plant in China, but offshoot of plant in, say, Thailand or Vietnam and, uh, and or Thai, uh, Taiwan. But those things, those days are kind of um, over. I think a lot of companies want to diversify their new locations elsewhere outside of Japan. So many companies today are looking at the U.S. as the next um, safe investment area. China isn't because China is becoming very expensive very quickly uh, uh, beyond the expectation. So many companies who have gone outside are now looking back and say, okay, where do we go if China doesn't work? Uh, for the next 10, 20 years, or if they have to kind of scale back in China until China stabilizes the cost situation or environmental situation or political situation, they are looking at Canada, U.S., Mexico, and the uh, U.S. is becoming or starting to look really good compared to China situation. So I'm working with a newspaper called Nik uh, Nikkan Kogyo Shimbun, uh, the, the leading technology uh, newspaper, daily newspaper, and they actually bring in dozens of companies to Oregon, and I'm part of the planning team, and they are looking at Oregon as one of the kind of early touching points for new plant development. Great, and, if you, and as you and I have spoken, um, a lot of opportunities for uh, Portland-based companies as it happens to be where we're located as well, but really when you start to look at, at, at San Francisco Bay Area, you start looking at Seattle, Portland, add in Vancouver, British Columbia, there's a real opportunity uh, for that, you know, if you take those together, they're the fifth largest economy in the world. I think there's huge opportunities for, for cross-fertilization uh, with Japan and, and this entire uh, coast. Um, Sean, I, I'd like to go to a different question now. We're starting to get these questions from the audience, and we're getting a whole bunch about the FIT, the feed-in tariff. And um, I, I know that the, the, the feed-in tariff as it's structured right now is, 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 is quite uh, uh, generous. Um, and I think it's more than 40 cents a kilowatt hour um, for solar PV. Um, wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about how the FIT is currently structured in Japan, as you know it, um, and how Japan is looking at um, really uh, keeping that in, in place over time. You know, the great thing about um, uh, solar technologies and other clean energy technologies is they have economies of scale where their price can decline over time. So are there mechanisms in the it to ensure that um, uh, it can help with price declines. I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what you know on, on, on the solar fit and in general. Okay. Uh, uh, the currently, the feed-in tariff to be applied to solar PB is uh, 36 cents per okay. kilowatt hour for future 20 years. For future 20 years, it is are guaranteed by Japanese government. So uh, I dare to say this is very much generous, but uh, the government is started to review this uh, tariff, uh, 36 cents per kilowatt hour. I converted it into uh, US using 100 M per US yeah, unit. Yeah. And, and most of the people believe uh, it will be reduced to 30 cents or something. Uh, and the Japanese government will uh, announce by the end of the coming March because uh, the Japanese fiscal year starts in April. The point is, point is, what has happened is, I remember at the beginning of this session, uh, you showed the number of seven gigawatt. It was kind of a bubble. Uh, I mean, the the photovoltaic uh, solar photovoltaic bubble. What happened is uh, the the. The, the level of application and the, the level of uh, approval is not always the level of actual installation. You, I, I mean, what's happening is most of the applicants obtained the, 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 the right to enjoy uh, 40 cents or 36 cents for future 20 years. Right. However, they have not yet started uh, the construction. And they are waiting for further price reduction, cost reduction of the solar panel, or they are thinking to on sale that or qualification right to somebody. That's why it's kind of it's kind of um, the money game. 
uh, in a sense. So the government started to uh, review the approved approved applicants once again, and also the government started to review the, the level of tariff itself, and most probably it will be reduced. So I think this is quite a natural course of action, and this is quite uh, okay, and uh, it will end up with a very a good level of tariff and uh, good uh, fair competition. Uh, the point is maybe uh, the Japan is very small, and uh, the, the suitable area for solar PV is limited, so, which means now is the time to consider uh, the new renewable energy, such as uh, mega, mega wind or uh, offshore wind, or, or uh, Japan is plenty of you know, the, the geothermal or uh, uh, hydro or biomass. So that's a, that's a very brief description of the solar PV. Okay, no, thank you very much, and I think it'll be interesting. A real quick question, just as a follow-up to that. Is there general strong public support? That was another question that people asked. But is there strong public support for the FIT in Japan? Um, as of today, uh, no big objection. However, my concern is the, the each local power company's charge some uh, cost to each uh, household to sustain this uh, feeding tariff. That's why today it's a very small amount uh, comparing to the uh, monthly charge. That's why nobody objects to the existing system. However, uh, you know, once we increase, dramatically increase the portion of renewable energy, uh, the, the, the charge to sustain feeding tariff will be also increased. In that case, uh, some people might uh, make uh, objection. Well, okay, well, it'll be interesting to keep tracking that. Uh, Nadim, I wanted to go to you now. Um, I had a question that's very similar to the one that just came from the audience. I'm going to take one from the audience, though, because it covers mm -hmm. my sentiment. Um, they were asking, can you share a bit about how you have been, um, um, what's your strategy uh, for entering the Japanese market, um, sort of, how did you look for a partnership to do that? And in your case, you, you lined up TEPCO initially. And, and the question here, and obviously would depend on the type of company, but how should one go about finding a strategic partner to facilitate market entry into Japan? Let me just say something real quick before you answer, Nadine. Uh, Jetro, uh, the sponsor of this webinar, uh, is available to help both um, U.S. companies looking to invest and expand in Japan, as well as Japanese firms looking to enter the U.S. market. So, if you're a Japanese or a U.S. firm looking to enter Japan, uh, please contact me or Bryce, and we can help connect you with, with Jetro. But Nadim, can you help us a little bit here? What are some of the things that people can do that are interested in entering the Japanese market? How does one go about um, uh, making partnerships, and, and what does that look like? Well, I, I, Ron, I think you took one step that we did, which is we, we actually found Jetro to be pretty helpful, um, just in giving us the bird's eye view of what's happening in the market. The, you know, being from the United States, the United States Commercial Service and the team at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo were also helpful because you know, the Department of Commerce as well as the Department of Energy, of course, are keeping close tabs on developments in the energy market in Japan um, right. for, for, for American reasons, but also just you know, for the perspective of bilateral relations. Um, you know, for us, it was really, we had two partner questions. Right, which is, do we partner with a industrial or trading company to pursue customers in the Japan market? And then secondly, do we, who are the correct or ideal customers with whom we can develop a partnership to you know, develop our products and services for Japan, recognizing that Japan is different, we're going to need to make changes, and we don't know everything. Right, and the utilities often do. So that was a very important decision for us. Um, you know, in terms of the how, um, the initial introductions that we got, which were very helpful, were actually from our investors um, who had developed very solid relationships in, in Japan over many decades. But what we were surprised by is how quickly we were able to pick up those conversations and drive them forward ourselves. Um, and that was because of the like latent interest in energy innovation, its recognition in Japan that foreign companies have something in many cases to offer. Um, 
we had much more receptive ears you know, in, in the conversations than we had initially expected, you know, as, as we heard war stories about doing business in Japan in the past. Great, and I'm glad that to hear that you, and I, I forgot that, but that you had worked with Jetro, and again, to everyone on this call, Jetro can be a great resource. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. We're, we've got a little bit more. I, I want to get a question in, um, and I'll start uh, with you, me too, and then come back to Nadim and, and also uh, to, to, to Sean. Um, to me, when I look out over the, 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 you know, the clean tech marketplace, uh, you know, obviously technology innovation is important. We know that. But, but the greatest innovations today seem to me not to be so much technical, but really about new business and financial models. So, um, Mitsu, could we start with you? Because I, I just, if you could just take a minute or so. I know that you're doing like even community stakeholder engagement in Japan. And I'm just really interested to hear a little bit about how is it that a U.S. firm or a U.S. group is being brought into Japan to do that. So that seems to me like a, a community engagement as a business model innovation. And then I want to quickly go to you, Nadim, on what you're finding. We'll talk about it, but in terms of localizing the way you present your data to clients and customers in Japan versus the US, and then we'll go to Sean. So Mitsu, let's start with you. So I will bring um, two actual um, examples so why even the facilitation uh, facilitators uh, brought from US uh, first client we've had and it's a confidential project in, in downtown Tokyo uh, what basically the client said we were tasked to create a global scale project that's sophisticated and uh, we need some help from overseas and they did a lot of studies and they found one of the Portland firms is great, but they didn't have any connection to, and then they ran into me when I was presenting in Tokyo. So it kind of it happened that way, but they are uh, trying to become more global in um, implementing solutions, even, even in urban development projects. That's number one. Number two, um, the country lacks facilitators uh, that are very good at moving projects forward. Uh, because uh, a lot of times, if there are professional facilitators, there are many today, but there are some, uh, they are not focused on the sustainability aspect. They are more focused on uh, kind of a community building only or one, one area of uh, specific expertise. And uh, our team brings multiple areas, uh, new solutions that the Japanese clients never heard before. So we hit many sweet spots in one project, in one team. And that's being kind of a social innovation to them. And then that offered an opportunity for you guys to come in, take that expertise, yeah. and apply it into the Japanese marketplace. Um, um, Nadim, let, let's really talk about this. I, I think a lot of people know about O-Power, and they understand the sort of an interface that, that the consumer interacts with. And you and I had spoken about this. I mean, in the US, um, you know, fear and competition to the drive activity. So can I do better than my neighbor? Sort of that idea. Um, in Japan, my sense is that that approach might not work as well as something like let's do it together, you know, gambare spirit. Um, at a high level, can you tell us a little bit about how you're taking your business innovation model and applying it to Japan, some of the interesting challenges that come up there? I'd just love to hear about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in, in short, I think you nailed it. Right? We don't and you're breaking up a little bit. Could you speak a little bit louder? Ron, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so you nailed it, Ron. I think that the, you know, the behavioral science that underlies O-Power, we believe, you know, transcends culture and language. But the way we apply it and create communications needs to be quite different for Japan. And so as you mentioned, you know, we, in America, we may be a little bit more aggressive in our tone in terms of catching customers' attention about a product that they really find boring, which is, which is energy. Whereas in Japan, we already have everyone's interest, and so we don't need to be quite so, say, blatant in terms of the call to action. Right. And rather, you know, appealing to people's sense of competitiveness or how they're doing vis-a-vis -vis others. In Japan, it's really more about you know, how can we do something great together, this Gambare spirit? Um, you know, I think one of the other things we observed is that the Japanese homes are 
even more run by the, the wives than, than in the U.S. and mm. people track their costs um, to a much higher degree of precision than Americans might. And so this idea of having a Kakebo book, which is so basically where all the household costs are tracked every month, um, is something that also applies to electricity. And so helping people keep updated on how they're doing vis-a-vis -a, -vis a budget is something that Japanese homes really like the idea of, whereas Americans don't care about it quite as much. I think that, Ron, one of the things I wanted to stress to this group, if there's anyone out there who's doing a business that all, it all touches either you know, direct consumer or a direct business model, is one thing we did very early on is we invested our own money in market research in Japan, both to kind of understand our own blind spots before we had a customer, but also to show prospective customers that we were actually serious about Japan, and that maybe we knew a few things about Japanese consumers that they didn't already. Um, and that ended up being relatively inexpensive in the big scheme of things, but really got a lot of bang for the buck for us, both in terms of knowing that we could deliver and developing confidence around that in the Japan market, but also showing that the customers that we are very serious and are keen to build a long-term relationship. Great. And, and Sean, what is, what is Bloom Energy learning right now in terms of uh, taking a business model innovation and applying it to Japan. Are you learning some unique lessons? Yes, uh, a lot of lessons. But uh, you know, the, first of all, to 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 change the existing system, we need a very bold and new idea and uh, uh, the initiative from a different perspective. In that context. You know, we are trying to do business from the perspective of joint venture with Silicon Valley company, Bloom Energy. Uh, and Japanese market is very conventional, traditional, and very, you know, slow to change. Even so, only newcomer, new perspective, new angle can change this system. That's why we do want to utilize the joint venture with U.S. company. And only newcomer can change. And uh, uh, you know, the now we have to change uh, because uh, because of the three one one. This is a consistent theme, a theme of today's discussion. Now we have to create the I, I call it a new normal. We are living in a totally different market, but uh, it takes time for people to recognize. Now it's a totally different world from the uh, prior. Uh, 311. Before 311 is uh, has gone, but uh, it takes time for people to understand. But uh, it is happening. That's why, uh, for example, Bloom. Uh, one of the our uh, menu is to offer a fixed price for future uh, 10 years or 20 years. But uh, this is kind of the breaking common sense. In the past, the existing system maybe. Uh, the all power can understand, but uh, why in the market only one year contract exists? It, it, it's strange, uh, and the, let's break the, break this common sense. That's why uh, we started to offer, uh, you know, long term uh, power supply contract. So this is one example too. Well, it's down. a great example, Sean, and and it really points out this idea of some new business models and going from a one-year contract to 10 or 15 or 20 and you know locking in that price stability. So uh, thank you all for sort of walking us through that. I wanted to make sure we cover that in today's call. We've got a lot of other questions. We're not going to be able to cover them all today. Um, but I, I hope you'll join us in continuing the conversation. Uh, we're going to be at the Clean Tech Forum uh, March 11th, 13th in San Francisco. Uh, uh, Jetro is helping sponsor a another conversation similar to this one. It'll cover some different territory, uh, but we're going to have a live in-person dialogue. I'll be moderating that with leaders from Panasonic, Itochu, and Bloom Energy, so we can really start to look at sort of the large corporates, the the emerging players, uh, and and also the trading houses. Um, um, if you'd like to join us and you haven't already registered, please use discount code sf 14 jetro friend. You can see it up there in, in Burgundy for 300 off the current registration price. Um, also, very quickly, uh, in this whole concept of SMEs and small, medium-sized enterprises, uh, 
We're going to have four companies visiting with us from Japan looking for U.S. opportunities. Uh, Daiki Ataka has an advanced waste energy biogas production process. Uh, HiBot offers a breakthrough in-pipe robot, really cool technology for inspection and intervention inside pipes. ACT has developed an organic biomass dehydrator technology, and GeoPower System provides an advanced heat pump technology for commercial and residential projects. Um, please contact me or Bryce Yonker. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about the Clean Tech Forum panel, if you'd like to meet with members of the visiting Japanese delegation, or if you'd like to connect with Jetro uh, on any other topic. Uh, I'm personally very excited. As I said earlier, I lived and studied in Japan. I did a junior year abroad uh, in college, went back, and am fascinated with Japanese culture. I'd call myself a Japanophile, and I'm very excited about the opportunities of forward, uh, moving forward. So. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed and found today's conversation helpful and as informative as I have. We look forward to continuing this important dialogue, and, and we hope you'll join us on that. Um, I'd like to thank Nadim, Sean, and Mitsu for their time and invaluable insights today, two of them dialing in from Japan very early in the morning. I'd also like to thank our co-host, Jetro, for making this webinar possible. Uh, and please note that this webinar has been recorded, and we plan to post a link on our website later. Uh, in the coming days. Uh, thanks again to all of you and to our panelists, and everyone have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.